وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith In our previous episode we discussed various aspects that go against one's ubudiyya or worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of them was talismans and amulets and seeking omens in today's lesson we're going to continue on the same theme and discuss magic in Islam what is Islam's position and status on this concept of magic stay tuned <laughs> Today's topic will be concerning magic and astrology and this is obviously a very interesting topic and one that is greatly misunderstood by many Muslims and even non-Muslims. People have gone to extremes with regards to this topic. Some of them have said there is no such thing as magic as well. However, this is clearly not true because we find that in the story of Musa alayhi salam when the, fa- when the Fir'aun called the magicians they were able to create an illusion. Right? When the magicians threw their staffs and they started slithering around like snakes, they created some form of illusion, magical illusion. Likewise, we know that the Prophet wasallam, he was affected by some Jewish magicians of his time. That they affected him only in the physical aspect, obviously, not in regards to his religion. That he thought that he had done some physical things where he had not done them. And because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the last two surahs of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas, and after they were revealed, and the Prophet ﷺ recited them, the magic was lifted away. So it is clear that magic is real. It is something that exists. But what exactly is it? Generally, magic involves asking the jinns to do something for you. And we said that jinns were a different type of species of creation. They cannot be seen by mankind. And they can travel at very fast speeds and they can carry very heavy objects. These are the physical capabilities Allah has given them. Now for us, these are things beyond our control. We, don't, we cannot travel that fast, nor can we carry things beyond a certain limit. But the jinns, Allah has given them certain powers He has not given us. So the black magician, what he does in general is he utilizes the sorcerer, he utilizes these jinn to make it appear as if he's doing something supernatural. So you find that you, you might see a person flying in the air and the jinn is only carrying him. You might see him bring something out of nothing. And here we're not talking about illusions where the, the, the old rabbit in the hat trick where there's this trick hat and the rabbit is inside the hat and you can't see it. No, we're talking about really procuring something out of nothing. Out of thin air he'll just pick something up and he has something in his hand. Where did it come from? The jinn was able to bring it to him instantaneously. It's something physical. It's like I hand you this glass of water. It's something I do. Likewise, the jinn can do something that we we cannot understand. They can go through these walls and bring physical objects with them immediately to the person. So it's something physical for the jinn, but for us it's supernatural. Us, we cannot do these things. So the black magician, what he does is, he appeases the jinn. He offers his sacrifices to the jinn. He worships the jinn. He worships the jinn. And because of that veneration, in return, the jinn helps him out. And this is the essence of black magic. Therefore, magic, and again we remind our viewers and our brothers and sisters here, that when I say magic, I'm not talking about the old cat in the hat type trick. Tricks which are illusions, deceit. No, I'm talking about real black magic. Magic which is able to cause an effect on someone. Or is able to procure something out of nothing. This type of magic is an example of blatant, open shirk. No person can practice magic and be a Muslim at the same time. Why? Because magic means he must worship other than Allah. 
He must worship those jinn. And in return, those jinns will give him what he wants. Magic is used in all societies and cultures. And it is rampant all over the world under different names. Voodoo, incantation spells, this and that. You know, the YJ boards. All of these type of things, they're a type of magic. Also to foretell the future, this is a subcategory of magic as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states in the Quran that magic is kufr. Um, in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 102, if you can hand me Tafsir Al-Sa'di, akhi. Surah Al-Baqarah verse 102, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the jinn at the time of Sulaiman. And you know that Sulaiman, Jazakallah khair, you know that Sulaiman, the great prophet of Allah, he was given control over the jinn by Allah's permission. He didn't do anything to the jinn. No, of course not. He didn't appease the jinn. A'udhu billah. Allah gave Sulaiman power to control the jinns. And this was a power that no one else before him or after him had. As for the magicians in our times, they do not have the power to control. No. They appease the jinns. They themselves become lower than the jinn. They worship the jinn. And then the jinn gives them what they want. So, Allah describes this in the Quran. And He says in Surah Baqarah verse 102, وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا Sulaiman did not disbelieve. Rather, it was the shayateen, the shaytans. They were the ones who disbelieved. How? يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ They were the ones who taught mankind magic. Because what the people had accused Sulaiman was that they said Sulaiman is a black magician. That's why he can control the jinn. How can he control the jinn? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re revealed that no, Sulaiman is not a black magician. Sulaiman did not disbelieve alayhi salam. Rather, it was the shayateen who disbelieved by teaching the people magic. So magic, and whoever practices it, magic is a branch of disbelief, of kufr. And whoever practices it has nullified, has cancelled, has abrogated his testimony of faith. In another, another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ clearly pointed out that magic is shirk. In uh, Sunan al-Nisa'i, volume 7, if you can hand it to me, akhi. Sunan al-Nisa'i uh, is uh, a sunan written by Ahmed ibn Shu'aib al-Nasa'i, and he died in the year 303 Hijrah. And this is also one of the famous six books of hadith. And remember, in this show, we'll take you back to the sources directly. We're not going to go to my opinion, your opinion, no. We'll take you directly to the sources. Look it up yourselves if you want. The hadith in Sunan al-Nisa'i is hadith number 4085. And by the way, Sunan al-Nisa'i here was a, uh, is actually a condensed version of a larger book that he wrote. Imam al-Nisa'i, he wrote a, a book, a very large book of hadith. When uh, he showed it to the people, they said, this is too much for us. Condense it, summarize it. So he chose the best hadith in that large work. And this is uh, the smaller version of that work, which we call Sunan al-Nisa'i. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that whoever ties some knots and blows in them. You know how the voodoo and the magicians, they do it. They tie their knots, they tie pieces of hair. They take small dolls and they do this and that with it. Whoever does this, then he has committed magic. And whoever commits magic has committed shirk. وَمَنْ سَحَرَ فَقَدْ أَشْرَكْ Clear-cut, authentic hadith. Whoever practices magic has committed shirk. It's right here in the books. It's not my words. It's not the words of some shaykh or imam. It's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In yet another hadith, we find that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that magic is one of the biggest sins in Islam. For he said, avoid the seven deadly sins. The first one is shirk. The second one, magic. The third one, and he went on killing people and taking orphans' property, and, and, and. But he mentioned magic right after shirk, showing you how dangerous and how evil black magic is. In fact, the penalty for magic is death. Uh, if you can hand me Sunan Abi Dawood, volume 8, we will find that magicians, their penalty is death. Hafsa, the wife of the Prophet wasallam, she discovered that one of her slave girls practiced magic. So she ordered that that slave girl be killed. Likewise, we find in this narration in Sunan Abi Dawood, number 3041, that Umar ibn al-Khattab, while he was the leader, the Khalifa of the Muslims, he sent out a letter to all of the provinces. And the first thing that he said in this letter, kill every single magician you find. 
Every magician you find, execute him because he's not a Muslim. He has left his religion of Islam and he is doing something so deadly, so evil that his existence cannot be tolerated by the Muslim society. So Umar ibn al-Khattab commanded, based upon the text of the Quran and Sunnah, that this is something which is clear-cut shirk and kufr, he commanded that every single magician be killed. And then the companion says, so we found three magicians in our city that day, so we executed them. And this once again clearly shows you that magic is a major shirk or kufr. There are many types of magic. One type of magic is that you summon the jinn to attack another person or even to kill him or to take their possession or properties. Another type of magic is when you tell the jinn to overtake, to possess another person's body. So that person will lose consciousness and the jinn will take over. And this also is a type of black magic. Yet another type of black magic is what we call voodoo. But there are many types of voodoo where you take a piece of hair or a body or fake body of someone or a nail or something and you tie knots around it or you blow on it. This too is a type of magic. Another type of magic is those who utilize jinns to predict the future. The astrologers and those who look into um, crystal balls or those who try to read the future through cards, or through uh, coffee or tea, if you know there's a type of way that coffee or tea, when you uh, mix it, supposedly the man looks in and sees where you're coming from. And one type of magic is astrology as well. Looking into the stars, trying to predict the future. All of these types of deeds, all of them involve the jinn. There is no act of this nature except that the jinn are there. The Prophet ﷺ described these people, is that the jinns, they're hearing the angels talk in the sky. The, the angels, Allah decides something, and so the angels talk amongst themselves, Allah has decided that so and so will die. So the, so the jinn overhears it, eavesdropping on it. Therefore he comes down to the black magician, to the astrologer, to the sorcerer, to the fortune teller, and he tells the fortune teller what he overheard from the angels. But along with that one truth, he adds a hundred lies. He adds a hundred lies. And the point is that he shouldn't have heard it in the first place. And even when he hears it, you don't know what he heard from what he didn't hear. Therefore, it is not allowed and impermissible to use the type of fortune tellers. We'll take a short break and we'll continue on this topic going into the aspect of astro astrology. See you soon. Anyone who chooses other than Al-Islam as a religion, as a way, it won't be accepted from him. This Qur'an has to be understood by the way the companions of Rasulullah understood the Qur'an. We disconnect ourselves from the actions of certain Muslims who oppress people and kill people unjustly. Discussing magic and the fact that it is a type of shirk or disbelief or associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One category of magic is astrology. One category and one subset of magic is astrology. Astrology is supposedly the science or the art of looking at the stars and trying to predict the future based upon the movement and the patterns of the stars. So astrology is different from a science called astronomy. Astronomy, astronomy is a physical science which maps, which charts out the movement of the stars. So it will tell you today the star will be here, tomorrow will be there. It's just a physical science. It doesn't read in anything into this. Today an eclipse will occur, tomorrow this will happen like this. This is astronomy, physical. This is of course permissible. What is impermissible is astrology in which you try to derive what will happen in the future? You try to extract from the movements of the stars your future. And this is something which clearly has been prohibited uh, in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. If you can give me uh, Abu Dawood, volume 10, Yaqi. Astrology and another aspect, the zodiacal signs as well. 
the signs of the zodiac, the 12 signs of the zodiac, they are just a type of astrology. Jazakallah khair. It is the same thing. Every person supposedly he is born on a certain day, he is assigned a certain sign. Okay? And this is all from the pagan traditions of the Romans of old. All of it. And it is pure and blatant shirk. Because you are trying to look into the future. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sunan Abi Dawood, in the chapter of uh, astrology and fortune telling, he has a whole chapter dedicated to this section. He said that whoever learns any astrology has learned any has learned magic. And the more he learns of astrology, the more he learns of magic. This is exactly what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Whoever learns any astrology, any portion of astrology, he has learned a portion of magic. And the more he increases in his learning of astrology, the more he increases in his magic. This is because, once again, our hearts, instead of going out to Allah, instead of trusting Allah, believing in Allah, knowing that He is the all-powerful, almighty, nothing happens except with His will, instead our heart goes out to imaginary things. What are the zodiacal signs? Nothing. They are the creations of Allah. They are signs in the sky. They are stars in the sky. So to put our hope, our trust, our fear in them is diverting an act of worship to them as well. In fact, not only is it prohibited to practice astrology, to practice magic, it is even prohibited to read about it, including astrology. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever goes to a fortune teller, whoever visits a fortune teller, and asks him about anything, will have his prayer rejected for 40 days. 40 days he will pray and he will not be rewarded for it. He will be rejected. What was the crime that he did? He visited. Just visited. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever goes to a fortune teller, and he believes in him, then he has disbelieved in what has been revealed upon Muhammad Notice the difference. You go to a fortune teller, your prayer is rejected for 40 days. You believe in him, you have committed shirk, so you become a disbeliever. Because you now trust someone else. You believe that this person knows everything. You believe that the fortune teller can predict the future. And no one knows the future except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says in the Quran, that no one knows what will happen tomorrow. No one knows when someone will die. No one knows where he will die, much less when, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa clearly pointed out that the one who visits a fortune teller commits a major sin. His prayer will not be accepted for 40 days. This is if you don't believe. You just go for the fun of it, as they say. And the one who actually believes in the fortune teller, then this person has disbelieved as per the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he has disbelieved in what has been revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let me ask you: Does it, does it make any difference if you visit the fortune teller or if you call the fortune teller to your house? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So, instead of calling the fortune teller, what if you ask the fortune teller to write his fortune for you and send it to the house then to write his predictions for you? Once again, the same thing. Therefore, when you open up a newspaper and you find the zodiacal signs being discussed, and what good or bad will happen to you, then this is exactly the same as going to a fortune teller. Because you are willingly, voluntarily, from your own will and basis, reading it. No one's telling you to read it. If you buy a newspaper and it has that section in it, don't even look at it. You will say, but I don't believe in it. The Prophet ﷺ has said clearly, whoever goes to a fortune teller will have his prayers rejected for 40 days. This is not trivial, brothers and sisters. It is not a joke. The same applies to fortune cookies. When you open up the fortune cookie, there's a little piece of paper that will come there and it will tell you the future. The same thing applies. Do not read it. Do not read these type of things because even by reading them, it is possible something might come into your heart. And by reading them, whether you believe in it or not, your prayer has been rejected for 40 days. This is an aspect of shirk, of kufr. No one can predict the future except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one can tell you what will happen tomorrow. No one can tell you when and how or why good or bad luck will come to you except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is of the knowledge of the unseen. 
So how come people go to these other people who are just as ignorant as them? Think about it, my dear brothers and sisters. These people, if they knew the future, why would they be charging you $5 or $2 to read your, your future? Or whatever they charge you. 5 rupees, 5 junayah, call it whatever you want. Something trivial of the world. If they knew the future, they would become multi-millionaires, multi-billionaires, become the presidents of the world. But because they don't, and they want to make money by cheating other people, they pretend to know the future, and they charge a few measly cents, a few measly coins, in order to supposedly tell the future. Which shows you their own ignorance. If they really and truly knew the future, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing right now. They'd be investing in the right stock markets. They'd be, be in the right place at the right time to, to gain the fortune. They'd be able to find all the fortunes of the world. Of course, these people are charlatans, frauds, ignorant people trying to attain money through unlawful means by tricking the people, the innocent people around them. And by going to them, by believing in them, a Muslim disbelieves in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you believe in them, then you are claiming that this person knows the unseen, that this person controls the future, that this person can tell me what will happen in the next few hours or the next day. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. The question arises, okay, you have told us that magic is a reality and that jinns can do things that we do not know and we cannot control. They can do supernatural things. So what is the protection that we have? What can we do to protect ourselves from black magic? Well, the Western world, quote-unquote, or the most of the other countries, they think that there's something called black magic and something called white magic. So they say black magic is bad magic and white magic is good magic. Black magic is done to harm someone and white magic is done to save that harm or correct that harm or do some good. But both magics involve procuring the jinn. Both magics involve doing something to appease them by giving them sacrifices, by prostrating, by doing sacrilegious acts. And if we had more time, we would have expounded more on these things. But these black magicians, those people who practice black magic or white magic, when I say black magic, I mean magic which is a real magic, whether it's called black or white in, uh, in other parts of the world. Magic in which jinn are used. These type of people are evil people. They do sacrilegious, blasphemous acts. Acts that are purposely done in order to appease the jinn. They might tell the person to sacrifice an animal in his name. Or they might tell him to, A'udhu Billah, go to the masjid and urinate in the masjid. Or A'udhu Billah, take the uh, uh, Quran and put it in a place it should not be put in. Sacrilegious, evil, blasphemous acts. So when a person does this and proves his devotion to the jinn, then the jinn in return does some favors to him. Trivial favors, brings him something out of nowhere. Okay, does something that is physically it is capable of doing, but we are not capable of doing. So the way to protect ourselves from magic is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why Surah Al-Farq and Surah Al-Nas were revealed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was afflicted with this magic, he recited Surah Al-Farq and Surah Al-Nas, he blew on his hand and then he put his hand, he rubbed his hand all over his body. This is the way to protect ourselves from black magic. Reciting the Qur'an continuously, blowing it over our hands and our bodies, using the adhkar and the remembrances found in the Qur'an and in the sunnah. We conclude by stating that magic in all of its branches, including astrology and the zodiacal signs, there are forms and manifestations of shirk. To practice them, or to study them, or to believe in them, are acts of major shirk. But even to read about them or to go to such people without believing in them, this is a major sin. And a sin which the Prophet ﷺ has told us that for 40 days our prayers will not be accepted. This is because when one's heart becomes attached to these people and these beings. And one believes that they know the knowledge of the unseen. And one believes that they have the power to bring good or to divert evil. And this is only something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. And therefore, the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, they have clearly, explicitly prohibited all types and all forms of magic. Inshallah, we'll see you next time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhum.